Thank you, Will. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Day of Atonement. I want to welcome uh, Andrew and Austin sitting here in the middle, two young men <laughs> visiting us from Texas. Be sure and welcome them today. All right. How many of you know that the book of Genesis is tied to the Day of Atonement? Did you know that? I was listening to Jonathan Kahn this week, and he's Jewish. He's very into atonement. He's very Christian. And so I just said, well, okay, I agree. So when we see in Genesis chapter 3, we see the serpent, Satan. He deceives Eve. She takes of the forbidden fruit and, and thus sins. She gives it to her husband and he eats knowingly. He knowingly sins. And then we see in verses 22 and 24 that God drives them out of the garden. And we see that he places curses not only on the serpent, but on them, their lifestyle, upon the world and the curse of sin falls on us all. But this day of atonement represents the end of sin. It began there for humans in the Garden of Eden. Not totally, I mean sin began before that with Satan, but I'm talking about us as human beings. It began in the Garden of Eden. But it ends with this day. And let's take a look at some of that. You know, the Day of Atonement in ancient Israel, it basically was focused on the nation of Israel. The Day of Atonement focused on the sins of Israel. The Christian Day of Atonement focuses on the sins of the world, the whole world. And we see that, that Jesus, when he left, to ascend, he told the disciples in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, yeah, Jerusalem to the Jews, and in all Judea to the Jews and Israel, and Samaria, well, those were Gentiles, and to the end of the earth. He sent them to the end of the earth, to now it's open, salvation. Deliverance from sin is open to all mankind. And we see that again in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. Jesus came and spoke, saying, All authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you to the end of the age. So what did he say? Make disciples of all nations. But let's take a look back at the holy days as they were given in Leviticus 23, verses 1 and 2. The Lord speaks to Moses. He said, the feasts of Yahweh which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts. They're the feasts of the Lord God Almighty. They're not Jewish. Some people say they're Jewish. They celebrate them, but they're the Lord God Almighty's feasts. In Leviticus 23, verse 26, the Lord spoke to Moses, the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the day of atonement. On the Hebrew calendar, that's today, this day, the tenth day of the seventh month. And he says, you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering. And you should do no work on that day. It's the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before Yahweh your God. Any person who is not afflicted in soul will be cut off. And down at verse 32, he repeats that again. He says, it shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest. 
you shall afflict your souls. On the ninth day of the month at evening, from evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. So from sundown last night, at the end of the ninth day until sundown tonight, we celebrate this Sabbath of atonement. Now, I was just recently asked by a new person here, why doesn't it say fast? Why does it say afflict your souls? What is that? That doesn't say fasting. Nope, it certainly didn't. Uh, the word, though, is the Hebrew word ana. It means to afflict, to abase yourself, to chasten yourself, to deal hardly with yourself, to humble yourself, to hurt, ravish yourself, weaken yourself. So how would you afflict your soul? How are you going to afflict your soul if you don't fast? What will you do to fulfill that, I wonder? I've thought about that. And also I thought there was a, a, a person was discussing this one time and he said, uh, I don't believe that the word fast was in the Hebrew language when God spoke to Moses. And so they used the closest thing to it, afflicting their soul. And I thought, well, is that true? So I looked up fast, fasting, fasted in the Bible. We never see that word. The first time it's ever seen is in the book of Judges. Hundreds of years after Moses is given these uh, holy days. And also we find that Paul, in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 27, he's, he's a prisoner on a ship going to Rome, and he tells the captain of the ship, hey, don't sail for Rome. It's too late in the year. It's, it's late in the fall. He says, the fast was already over. And he advised him, don't do this. Well, all the scholars say the fast he's talking about was in, was this day, the Day of Atonement. So he said fast. The Jews have always fasted on this day. I fast on this day. If you can figure out a way to afflict your soul some other way, I hope it's acceptable to God. Uh, so also I wanted to talk about where the word is found in Judges 20, verse 26, is the first time that fasting, where it's talking about going without food, is mentioned. In Judges 26, it says, they sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening, and they offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Uh, Joshua was already dead. It was probably more than 100 years after the giving of the feast days back in Exodus and Leviticus. In Ezra chapter 9 is the first time we find the word fasting, Ezra. Now, Ezra is coming after the captivity of the nation of Judah went, was taken in captivity to Babylon, and after they came back and reestablished Jerusalem and rebuilt the temple, this is said, he's, Ezra says here in chapter 9, verse 5, At the evening sacrifice I arose from my fasting, having torn my garment and my robe, and I fell on my knees, spread out my hands to the Lord my God. And I said, oh my God, I'm too ashamed and humiliated to lift up to you, my face to you, my God. Also, the word just fast, where it meant food, was the first time shown in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And it's David speaking, remember, the little baby that he had conceived in adultery with Bathsheba was born, and the prophet Nathan came to him and said, that child will die because of your sin. 
Well, David, it says David fasted while the child was alive. And he wept, and, and then he realized at some point after seven days that the child was dead. And he told his servants in verse 23 of 2 Samuel 12, Now he's dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he shall not return to me. So those, those were the first places that fast, fasting, and fasted are in the Bible. They're way after the feast was originally given there in Leviticus 23. So I believe it's possible that the word fast was not in their vocabulary. Think about how our vocabulary changes. What words are in our vocabulary today that you didn't, wouldn't have seen 50 years ago? Quite a few, frankly. Quite a few. Or 100 years. Go back 100 years, the word computer is not there. Computing, laptop, iPhone, uh, iPad, tablets, anything like that. Nothing like that is in, there, in the vocabulary. And these, this... The word fast didn't show up till hundreds of years after the feasts were given, in, in Scripture at least. Okay, so let's look at uh, Leviticus 16. I just want to kind of paraphrase through most of it. In verses 1 to 6, it tells us how Aaron was not to go into the Holy of Holies only one time a year. And, and he couldn't go except with blood from a bullock and a ram to represent payment for his personal sins and that of his family. And he had to take that. Well, <clears throat> and it also tells us in verses 3 and 4 that he stripped off his ornate garments and put on only white linen. You can go on your own time, read the whole chapter 28 of Exodus. It tells the ornate clothing of the high priest. I mean, it was gold and blue and purple and scarlet threads were woven into his clothing of fine linen. He had a turban on his head with a gold plate hanging on it, which said, the Lord is holiness or something of that matter was written on it. On the, and over, over his garments, he had this blue-like uh, cloak, beautiful royal blue, and on the, and on the hem of that garment were uh, representations of pomegranates in their color and bells, bells of gold all around the end. He was just elaborate. He had jewels on his shoulders. He had a breastplate was full of 12 beautiful ornate jewels set in gold. He had to strip all that off on the Day of Atonement. Put off your holy garments and put on this simple white linen. That represented something. Strip off everything off of you and appear before your God holy. He was going to go into the holy of holies. Appear before your God holy. And it should uh, represent something for us that if we want to enter in the presence of God, we need to strip off of ourselves our religiousness our reputations, our business, our busyness, our status in this human life, our achievements, or whatever else that we have clinging to us that we need to strip off to appear in the presence of a holy, holy, holy God. We can take a lesson from that in Leviticus 16. Well, in verses 7 to 10, it tells us about two goats that the uh, congregation picked them out and gave them 
to the high priest. And he, like, uh, took the lots, the, the thing that they shook like lots to determine the lot. And one lot fell on one goat, and they would put, like, tie some ribbons around his horns or something to designate. This is the goat for the Lord. The other one was the goat for escape or release. And so the goat for the Lord, he took that goat and killed the goat for the sins of all the nation of Israel. And he, was, he had to actually take that blood into the Holy of Holies. And you know how he went in there? With a huge amount of incense. Smoke, smoke, smoke coming up as he parted the curtain, heavy smoke to protect himself in case the presence of God was there. And he sprinkled the blood in there and he got out of there. And it says in Jewish uh, history that they used to tie a rope around the high priest's foot in case he died in there. They could pull him out because they couldn't go in there to get him. So anyway, he went in there with that blood. And then he came out and he laid his hands on the other goat's head. And he prayed over it. And because it was for all the sins he in Leviticus 16 20 and 22 I'll read it he brings the live goat and Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel all their transgressions concerning all their sins these three categories that cover all sin, iniquity, transgression, and sins, and he confessed them for all the nation over the head of that goat. Because the goat would bear on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabited land. And then it says that the, the man that took hit the goat out there to a completely desolate, uninhabited place would release the goat, release it. So in a sense, the picture here of the high priest confessing all the sins on something Jesus, Jesus' acts that he did were a type of the two goats. He shed his blood, the type of the first goat, and he took our sins as far as the east is from the west. Our sins, our iniquities, transgressions on the second goat. Jesus did it all. And so when we think about it, think about that goat being released. Have you released all of your sins? Or are you still kind of clinging is something clinging to you? You haven't forgiven yourself. Think about it. If God has forgiven you, if he's forgiven me, am I greater than God and cannot forgive myself? If there's something you haven't forgiven yourself for, release it. Like the goat. It's released to go away. Release it. Don't feed the goat. Let it go. Release it. Release it. That's the picture for us in the New Testament. Picturing our sins removed. As far as the east is from the west, that's found in uh, Psalm 103, verse 12, is that scripture. We need to release to Jesus all of our sins, all of them to him. You know, Daniel and his prophecy he prophesied that the end of sin the end of transgression the end of iniquity would come with messiah it was prophesied by the prophet daniel we find that in daniel uh, 9 beginning in verse 24 <clears throat> the angel gabriel had come to him and gave him this prophecy he said 70 weeks are determined for your people in your holy city to finish what? The transgression, 
to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to anoint, to seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. And he says, know and understand from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. See, he was still in captivity. The command had not yet come to rebuild Jerusalem. Uh, until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And it's weeks of years. And it counts down to the very time of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Because, you see, he brought that end to sin, iniquity, and transgression by his sacrifice, which the Day of Atonement sacrifices picture Jesus. In Hebrews 9, verse 26, it says, it's talking about Jesus. <clears throat> if he was like a regular priest, high priest, he would have to every year to go through all these sacrifices, but he's not. It says he would then have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of ages, you see the end of the age actually began with Jesus when he came. That's when the, the end of the ages began. It's still going on, but it began then. It says, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself as it is appointed for men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So he came to put an end to sin. Does that mean that sin doesn't exist today? No. He put an end to the penalty. He erased the penalty for us the penalty of our iniquities, transgressions, and sins. There's another event that's tied to the Day of, of Atonement, and it's called the Jubilee. You've heard of the Jubilee. It happens once every 50 years. I heard on the news that uh, the nation of Israel is celebrating a Jubilee this year. They're celebrating a Jubilee. So I don't know how they counted it, but it says they are. Anyway, in Leviticus 25, beginning verse 8, it talks about the Jubilee. He says, you'll count seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years, and the time of the seventh Sabbath of years shall be to you 49 years. And then you shall cause the trumpet of Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of the atonement. You shall make the trumpet sound throughout all your land, and you shall consecrate the 50th year. So then after those 49 years are counted, the whole 50th year is consecrated as the Jubilee year. And for them, for Israel, <clears throat> remember they were all allotted, allotted land in the, in the promised land. Every family was allotted land and it was never to go out of their family. But some of them became poor and they actually ended up selling their land to someone because they went into poverty. Well, God made it so that at the 50th year, all release of lands go back to the families that they were originally granted to. Everybody received their inheritance back. That's the jubilee that they had. Well, that was for the Israelites. What about our inheritance as Christians? Our inheritance is the kingdom of God. It's, it's the first resurrection. It's salvation. It's eternal life. That's what our inheritance is. So it's tied into the jubilee. Our jubilee is just in front of us. And it's tied to this day of atonement because the sacrifice of Jesus which is pictured by this atonement, brings our jubilee when we will receive our inheritance as children of God. We'll receive our inheritance. Matthew 25 and verse 34, Jesus said, The king will say to those on his right hand, 
Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit. See, it's inheritance. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. In the book of Hebrews, uh, from chapters 8 through chapter 10, explains the priesthood of the Lord Jesus, that he has taken the place of that high priest who did those, who performed those uh, sacrifices on the Day of Atonement for Israel in the past. But Jesus is our priest, high priest, who intercedes for us. He is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He's of the tribe of Judah, of which no priesthood in the Old Testament or in the New came from that. It came from Levi. So let's look in Hebrews 8. I'm sorry, by the way, I, I was so distracted this week, I didn't make any slides, so I have none. Uh, in Hebrews 8, verses 1 and 2, says, The main point of these things we're saying is we have such a high priest who's seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected, not man. This is not a man-made temple, man-made tabernacle. It's in the third heaven. It's what the Lord God created there. And Jesus is at the right hand of power as our high priest there. Down in verse 6 of Hebrews 8, he says, He has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no place sought for a second. But he found fault with them. The people, we the people, were not able to keep the original covenant. We just are too faithless, unfaithful. We're, we're sinners. We're broken. We can't keep the law perfectly. We couldn't. You and I couldn't keep the first covenant any better than Israel could have. The only one that kept that first covenant was Jesus Christ of Nazareth in the flesh. He kept it, and therefore he could, as the son of the living God, perfect, faultless, he could die on the cross and pay the wages that I've earned. The wages of sin is death. You've earned it, I've earned it. He paid, he paid our fine, you might say. The judge releases us because our fine has been paid. Anyway, it says, the fault was with them. And he says, I make a new covenant, not like the old covenant. He says in verse 10, this covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. And none of them will teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they'll all know me from the least to the greatest. And I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Isn't that a wonderful? He's not going to remember all those nasty, filthy things I did. He's not going to remember it unless I bring it up to him. Don't bring your old sins that have been forgiven back up to God. Why bring them up? He's put them away. Hebrews 9, jumping to Hebrews 9, verse 6, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing services, but into the second part the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. When was that way into the holiest of all made manifest? By Jesus. 
Remember when he died and the veil was torn from top to bottom so that there was an open way into the Holy of Holies? Verse 11, Hebrews 9. Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. It's, it's not of this creation physical, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all. After he was resurrected on that first day of the week, he told Mary, don't cling to me. I've not yet ascended to my father because on that day, he ascended as the first of the first fruits into the holy of holies made by God and presented his own blood there. That's what it's saying here. Obtaining eternal redemption. Verse 13, for at the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, these sacrifices purifying the flesh, how much more, verse 14, shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that we might receive the promise of what? we receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Verse 22, according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And he says that Christ has not entered the holy places, verse 24, made with hands, which are copies of the true. You see, the tabernacle was a copy of what was like in the heavenlies. And likewise, the temple later. But into heaven itself now appear in the presence of God for us. That's Christ appeared there for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year, with blood of another, he would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But at the end of the ages, he's appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And that's ultimately what atonement looks toward. It looked toward that ultimate sacrifice of the Messiah of Jesus Christ. He made the ultimate sacrifice almost 2,000 years ago for us. So he says in verse 28, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. And that's what we're waiting for, that second coming the coming to change us from mortal to immortal, from corruptible to incorruptible. Well, the second death will have no power on us. And we shall join him in setting up the kingdom of God, ruling, he will rule out of Jerusalem again. Again, he will accept Jerusalem. Again, there will be a temple of God in Jerusalem. It's coming. Let's see where I left off here. <clears throat> He's a high priest over the house of God, it says. You know, it says in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death. That's the wages we, we have earned, all of us. But the second half of that sentence is tremendously powerful, having to do with the atonement. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 9, 15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. That gift he's given us. He wrote in Ephesians 2, verse 8, for by grace you've been saved through faith, 
And that's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, you see. Salvation is a gift from Jesus, from God the Father. It's a gift. And it says in John 3, beginning verse 15, that whoever believes in him, Jesus, should not perish, but have eternal life. And then that famous verse, everyone knows, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Saved, what an amazing thing. And I want to finish with that scripture that Tanya read in the scripture reading. Revelation 19. I'm going to read at least part of it. Revelation 19 and verse 6. Then I heard what it sounded like a great multitude, like the roaring of rushing waters. Have you ever been to Niagara Falls? Crashing, roaring waters crashing down. A roar. Like loud, and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. We are the bride of Christ. That wedding is coming because of this day, because of the atonement, because we are atoned before, for, because we are redeemed, because we are saved, because we are loved by our Heavenly Father and our elder brother, the Lord Jesus Christ, our King, our soon coming King of kings and Lord of lords. He's coming. We, are, we have received the atonement. Break that up into three words. We have received the at one mint. We are going to be at one with the Lord Jesus Christ when he marries his bride. We will be fully at one at that time. And we need to pray for our fellow humans that are still in the dark, human beings on this earth that haven't come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray that they will some point receive the Lord Jesus Christ, so they can receive the atonement, which we have. The end, it pictures Jesus' complete sacrifice of the end of sin, the payment he made to end curses on mankind because of sin, and that coming jubilee, and we will inherit our wonderful inheritance, life forevermore. Happy atonement.